důvodu zdravotní indispozice musela Jaralí zrušit svou účast na festivalu Černobyl Fest v dubnu 2023 v Českých Budějovicích. Rozhovor se uskutečnil na platformě Zoom v červnu 2023 a je alespoň malou náhražkou festivalového setkání a besedy s autorkou. Děkujeme Jařelí a jejímu týmu za možnost tento rozhovor zrealizovat. I'm an activist filmmaker, and sometimes people ask me if I'm more an activist or more of a filmmaker. <laughs> I actually do use film as a tool for activism. I'm very involved in humanitarian issues, anti-war, and against oppression, against occupation. So film is a creative tool to inform, educate, and engage people towards more action. This film on Chernobyl, in order to attract young people, I made it like an adventure film, but ultimately I love people to think about deeper issues like nuclear energy and uh, the idea of our insatiable desire for excitement and how humans are surreal when they want to transform Chernobyl into tourist destination and to the point that even Fukushima people came and said, how can we turn Fukushima into a post-apocalypse tourism too? So it's the commodification of the world where nothing is, you know, just there. Everything has to be commodified. So there are a lot of philosophical questions besides all the adventure of the film. <laughs> I also have a small foundation. So I do a lot of work that are related to the films we make because uh, uh, many, many years ago, I realized that to just document is not enough. So I realized that it's not about going and taking these difficult stories and just going and making films, getting awards and leaving people as I found them, you know? So we actually make films, but we also collaborate with a lot of the people that we feature in our films. So we've been uh, doing a lot of work and we even sent support to some of the stalkers that are now, now in war. You know, we I made the film before the war and I could never imagine that Russia would do this attack and, and the country, this beautiful country, Ukraine, would be in this situation this moment, you know. So we are working very hard, sending now at this moment a lot of humanitarian aid to Ukraine and trying to keep people resilient and going. A lot of the stalkers are actually now soldiers trying to, you know, combat uh, Russian soldiers. And uh, as always, I try not to get involved in military things because. I know I'm very idealistic. I try to promote a peace with the art and creativity and nonviolence. But I know when it comes to situations of state terrorism, where countries just invade other countries, it's hard to win the, this, this battle with the white flags and arts and culture. But this is basically what I try to you know, uh, promote. So we don't get to situations of war if we can. And uh, I really appreciate that the kids in Czech Republic came and appreciated the film and, and enjoyed and made them think about some of the other issues going on. So a lot of times also with the films, you know, people say, oh, it was so inspiring. And I'm like, okay, but turn this inspiration into action. <laughs> you know, the whole thing is about getting people more proactive because to be informed, to be inspired, to be educated is not enough. We really need to be hands-on because the world is falling apart. Japan is um, um, going to throw the radioactive water in the ocean. And people in California will be <laughs> receiving the fish that is, you know, swimming in radiated water, you know, in, in contaminated water, because we are all interconnected. We have to really think globally, despite the fact that, yeah, we have to do our local action. And this, you know, ripple effect will create a global effect, a positive change effect, hopefully. But we're going to get all these kids proactive we are collaborating with people that we filmed like in 2010 people we filmed in 2000 like I made a film about the woman under the 
Taliban back in 2000. And then you fast forward to 2023, we are exactly as it was back then. So these trillions of dollars of US taxpayers' money did not make a difference for the Afghan people. They're suffering again under the Taliban and girls cannot go to school anymore. So we are trying to do a lot of work in support of these girls that simply just wanna go to school and they cannot. Um, the whole thing actually was a wake up call when I was making this film in 2000. I went to the uh, Afghan refugee camps in uh, Peshawar in Pakistan to make this film. And they started shooting with the Kalashnikov and throwing stones at us. And I was like, I'm here trying to take your plight and tell the world what's going on. And they were yelling in the air saying, you know, every day we have journalists, filmmakers and photographers and people come take photos, make films, write reports and articles and nothing changes for us. We are fed up of you guys, you know? And then I was like, wow, they're true. They're right, you know? They, we, we get awards, we get prestige, we get respect by telling you these stories, but what, what trickles down to them, you know? So I, that's when I decided to start this foundation work and do very proactive work with all the people that tell their difficult stories in our films. For me, a documentary filmmaking, it, it, the stories reveal themselves through the people I meet in the journey. I never come with a preconceived idea or I don't do deep research, pre-production research to come with the, with the story I wanna tell and just find people that will make that story realize you know, itself. I actually let the journey take its own way and, and then it's a huge editing uh, job because all this material has to become you know, a, a story. But I give a lot of freedom to the people I, I, I encounter throughout the way and let them tell the story. It's not me with the script at all. And in general, my idea is that people can see things their own way. But back then, we know when I was documenting how people, they create indoor beach because they don't like uh, the jellyfish and the, the mosquitoes. And to me, it was very bizarre how humans were using technology to conform nature to our needs instead of us adapting to nature. You know, we want to eat fruits in the winter that only come out in the summer. We just want to twist things around. So again, philosophical questions about human insatiability for control. But at the end, I let people decide, is it bad to go to the indoor beach when the regular beach is right outside, the natural beach is right outside? <laughs> You know, and the stalkers is the same. I mean, it's a subculture and some people are very adamant against it. And some people are like, wow, I really want to go there. I want to visit Chernobyl with the stalkers. <laughs> so I think, you know, I think that's why we have wars because everybody wants to impose their ideas and opinions. But a lot of times there are many angles to see a situation. People ask me, but at the end of the day, it's, is it dangerous or not to visit Chernobyl? And I'm like, it depends on the day. If there is wind or if the forest is on fire, the radiation will go up. If it's you know a peaceful day without wind, without fire, and you are in a certain area of the exclusion zone, it's okay. But you know, if you start going too deep into areas, you know, then it becomes dangerous again. So there are no clean cut answers and uh and when i was asking people the scientists would have one opinion the tour operators would have another opinion the stalkers would have another opinion about the level of danger you know and i myself as a filmmaker i was like oh my god this guy is you know beeping too high i'm gonna go back to the bus <laughs> but um Humans are insatiable for excitement. They are willing to put themselves into radiation in order to be an excitement. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> we are a very strange species. <laughs> My filmmaking is very much about life journey. Sometimes I encounter things that I'm just like, oh, I have to document this. It's so bizarre, you know? And I was in Ukraine and um, um, back then, you know, this whole situation, 
was already kind of getting bad because you know it's not the first time Russia is trying to take parts of Ukraine, you know. And they were like, oh, make films about Donbass, make films about it. And I was like, well, this is headline news every day. So I feel this is not something I should be covering, you know. But this whole thing about Chernobyl being, being the destination number one for tourists, I thought it was very like, wow, off the beaten path, you know. And then I decided to make a film about that. And uh, I just cannot believe that, you know, now with this war, Russia took over and they were playing around, making radiation go up again. And uh, so now when we show the film, it's a different context. It's to show that Chernobyl is not something from the past, but it's something that can become as dangerous as it was many years ago. And we should we have to be attentive and we should actually think about nuclear energy as a whole, because no matter if we had Chernobyl, Fukushima and so many other disasters that we actually list at the end of the film with the credits, nuclear energy is still very popular. I mean, in Korea, for example, it's they use a lot of nuclear energy in France. We have a lot of nuclear energy. And people just don't learn, you know, they they have even a lot of promoters that say, no, oh, this is, you know, carbon free. It's not like oil. It's a ecological energy. But one needs to ask what you do with nuclear waste and look at what happened with Chernobyl. So it's not so clean cut, positive kind of energy. No, I actually went with the Chernobyl Festival and uh, it was the time where we had a lot of artists. And as you saw in the film, you know, they came to do art installations and photography workshop. Some people come for extreme sports. Some people want to jump from the anti-ballistic missile, the ABM radar. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so it was a, it was a time where Chernobyl was kind of like at the peak of the tourism and uh, it was crazy. Sometimes you see like buses and buses and buses arriving with people, you know, and uh, I was very fortunate to work in collaboration with many people who actually have been there more than 10 times. I had one filmmaker from uh, Slovakia actually who gave me like gigabytes of footage that we also use in our film. And I also got a lot of footage from the stalkers who even went there in the winter and stalkers getting drunk and stalkers doing crazy things like burning wood to get warm. And that is very radioactive. So we got to show a little bit of that in the film. And uh, we got a lot of material from people who were there as liquidators and survived. So it was a huge logistical project where it was not just about production footage, but a lot of archival material and research and the post-production work. And uh, I cover a lot of conflict areas in my films, but I have to tell you that radiation filmmaking is even more scary. <laughs> so I guess I'm always looking for difficult films to make. <laughs> but because I want to bring some of these unusual stories and unusual angles, you know, and I feel this is my role. I mean, uh, there are plenty of people talking about love stories and romance, so I have to do some of these more like uh, obscure subjects. <laughs> It took uh, more than a couple of years to get all the paperwork and the permissions. And uh, I think I'm just very fortunate that people trust me and they collaborate with me because I'm basically like a symphony, you know, conductor. And at the end, I depend on all the musicians to make this symphony happen. And I've been very fortunate to always have the support of so many members of the community. Even the stalkers, they're very secretive and they gave me very sensitive footage. And at the very end, they even asked me to blur their images because, you know, they had this huge fire back then when we were finishing post-production and they wanted to use the stalkers as scapegoat and kind of accuse them as the cause of the fires. In reality, it was not, but uh, 
you know, they just wanted to keep their themselves anonymous. So I was very respectful and I had to redo the whole post-production just to blur their their faces and everything. So I think also the reputation that I'm very respectful to all the people who collaborate with me, you know, because um, at the end of the day is about keeping people safe because a lot of people give me materials for all my films and they are risking their lives or their safety and I have to be very respectful because that comes first and even if it sometimes is a wonderful shot but if it's going to put people in danger I will take it out and sacrifice the film content in order to provide the safety that the people taking the risk um, you know are in that situation so I think this is very important as a filmmaker because I see a lot of documentary filmmakers that are very ruthless you know they just want to tell the best, most impactful stories. And then they leave, but then people get sent to concentration camp or get put in jail because that footage got into some Western person's, you know, film. And I'm really not interested in that. I'm really interested in respecting all the people who work with me as first priority. I don't know how aware these kids are that it is dangerous and some of them are actually children of liquidators and the parents were like we were forced to be there because the Soviet government forces to become bio robots and clean that mess but you kids want to go you know free will <laughs> And the parents just cannot understand, you know, but I think teenagers, young people, they're curious about the world and they are willing to take risks. And humans are like that, you know, humans don't always do things that are sensical or healthy. People want excitement. If you think about it, I'm a little bit of a filmmaker stalker kind of style because I'm also going to dangerous areas. And if you really think about it, why am I putting myself into these situations? I mean, uh, at least I'm not going for adrenaline. You know, I see a lot of these war journalists and war photographers. I, sometimes I think they go for the wrong reason. Me, I go because I get extremely upset with the level of injustice and oppression and criminality that uh, governments perform and they get away with murder. And I just don't think this is right. And sometimes I feel that I have to be there to document things that are just completely absurd and not acceptable. But it is true that on a personal level, I am putting myself in danger. But I don't know, I think we all make our decisions how we want to conduct our lives. And I decided that I would be an activist filmmaker. So, um, you know, I go to conflict zone, I go, go to war countries, I go to refugee camps, and I try to document it. But I am always trying to figure out ways of turning this sad stories into empowering stories. So um, it's not just about documenting suffering or, or war, it's about showing that even in situations of extreme uh, um, danger and situation, there are amazing people doing amazing humanitarian work. And I try to um, um, you know, show that and encourage people to be more humanitarian. skeptical because of the nuclear waste and uh, but at the same time I'm always aware that I have a very idealistic view of the world you know and uh, there is no way we can sachet the energy hunger the world has if we don't retract in our actions so I think uh, if we continue with this level of consumerism and energy hunger there is no way we would be able to maybe just use solar energy or wind energy so i think it would take a you know our eight billion people in the world would have to make very big uh, personal decisions in order to avoid nuclear energy which would be retract our consumption our desire of having things or traveling or having fun or eating or <laughs> or buy beautiful clothes, everything we do 
that just pushes the world to be more carbon footprint. <laughs> so I think if we don't have some sort of major paradigm shift, I don't know if there will be change and scientists are hired to just make nuclear energy more and more sophisticated so we can keep consuming and consume even more than we are consuming now. <laughs> and I just don't know where this is all gonna go because climate change is, it's super real. I mean, yesterday I was just looking at the cyclone. They're just evacuating 100,000 people in Pakistan because the cyclone is coming in a very horrendous way. And I made a film in the Pacific um, Islands where the sea rise is coming up and it is swallowing countries. And with this year was declared that the first country will disappear to Valo, which is a island country in the South Pacific, it was declared the first official country that will disappear. So now they're digitizing their music and their dance and their literature and their culture because the country will no longer exist and the next generations will learn about their country just through digital files. So I don't know. I mean, I don't know where the world is going. <laughs> The film we are finishing is about the official indigenous people of uh, Europe that most of you guys don't know much about. I think that the Europeans know more about Native Americans from the US than your own uh, uh, official indigenous people, uh, the Sami people from Northern Norway, Finland, Sweden, uh, uh, Russia. So I made a film about these indigenous people and their plight because the reindeers, they don't know borders. They just want to move freely. And, uh, and, and now this sophisticated problem, which is also the, the renewable energy, because all these windmills are actually also deforesting, you know, parts of the Scandinavian countries because they need to build these huge, you know, windmills and uh, it's hurting the, the reindeers and hurting the forests. A few months, you know, we are just doing color correction, a sound mix, and uh, yeah, we got the, finally the archival sorted out, and again, lots of people supporting and collaborating, but a lot of paperwork, a lot of clearances. <laughs> so hopefully soon we'll have these new films circulate and bring up new questions. I'm very open to have the kids also connect with us uh, via social media so we can stay in touch long term. I love staying in touch long term with everybody. <laughs>